Well, I'm so excited to talk to you. I follow you on Instagram. I just, I love seeing your kiddos and seeing what you're working on. I mean, I don't know how you do it all. Being a mama and a singer songwriter, you juggle so many roles. Yeah, I don't really. <laughs> I do. Well, I think, no, I think the word you used is right, juggle. Juggling is good. I don't think whenever whenever the balance question comes up, I'm like, no, no, no there's no balancing. There's only juggling. <laughs> yes. And I had the opportunity to listen to um, A Thousand Hallelujahs, which is just such awesome. a beautiful song. And it's on your seventh solo album called Seven. So talk about what inspired this album and sort of the, the process behind it. Yes, this will be the first and probably the last album under my own name. Uh, I would never had a desire ever to release, uh, kind of like you were talking about earlier, like my, like my name is me, like that's who I am and that has not been, uh, you know, on things which I am, have enjoyed. Um, and so yeah, so I, this project was not my idea, um, but I am at the, uh, I, 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 my life is not my own, I guess. I, get, I do what I'm told. And so kind of the Lord made it really clear uh, to my surprise, yeah, relatively recently um, that this was something that was going to happen. Um, so I didn't, I didn't ever seek to write an album. Um, it was more like these songs came um, with, diff with, with different friends around the country. Um, and I realized that, that this was a thing, um, that these songs belong together and were a collective that was supposed to be out there in the world. And this was kind of, I guess, the, the only avenue by which uh, to do that. And so that's what this is. So yeah, I'm still obviously um, part of Hillsong Worship and love that, planted there. Um, Brooke Fraser, my mainstream career exists over here. And then now, um, yeah, this is, for me, this is not a trajectory or a, um, a, a a page turn. This is a step of obedience and God gets to do with it what he wants. Yeah. yeah. That's beautiful. Now, a thousand hallelujahs. I listened to it so many times last night. You are, you just have such a gift. Your ministry is such, such a gift. So talk about the inspiration behind this particular song. Yeah, this song is, um, this I think was one of the, the last songs that came along and it was just such a beautiful surprise and such a blessing. Uh, so my husband Scott and I um, went down to our friend Phil Wickham who lives just about an hour down the road from us and we were riding in um, the the church that Phil goes to, which is like this old little church hall um, in Southern California. Um, and we were, you know, sitting in the church hall with the keyboards and the guitars and this just this beautiful empty hall and kind of started talking about all the generations of people who had worshipped in this church um, and uh, and were so, and just were so inspired by that, the general, the generational nature of the church of Jesus and um, we started talking about the thousands of hallelujahs that had been sung in that room and so that's where that phrase came from and the song just kind of poured forth all of us at the end of it were kind of like did that just happen like thank you Lord um, and so yeah I feel um, yeah so so blessed um, that that this song has been entrusted to us and uh, and we just really pray that it's a blessing uh, for the church and that it actually is really helpful in church services I think this has this song has a really um, obviously it's very joyful it's very vertical but it has a real practical application and we pray that it just it is actually helpful in building the church that's our that's our desire for sure. What drives this desire to make music that is so helpful to the church that the church can use as a tool? Yeah, I think um, because I love the church, <laughs> I'm part of the church and obviously, um, and you know, I know from my own um, experience, like at the moment, um, our campus of Hillsong um, that my family and I attend, you know, we don't have a building right now, we're meeting in a tent. And so, uh, uh, so I feel like I feel really blessed to be in a position that actually probably a lot of worship leaders are around the country are in. We don't have a fancy PA. We don't have a big LED screen. We're, you know, reading, we're singing to lyrics that are on TVs, on stands. It's a really modest time. And so I think I'm really conscious at the moment of what are the songs that work in that context? Because they're not the songs that have 
five million parts and are very complex and require four part harmonies like the the songs that are vertical that point people to Jesus straight away um, and that can sound great with just a piano and guitar if that's all you've got and that's what because I just from my experience as as a local church member those are the songs that we're finding are building our faith in the congregations week by week and so I think that's why I have a real I have a front row seat to I feel like what um yeah, what, what's helpful, what blesses me as a congregant, but also what blesses me as a person who is then leading the congregation in these settings, which have uh, been so movable for so many churches throughout the pandemic. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and it's also sort of an homage to the early Christians, you know, the hymn writers like John Newton and Charles Wesley, those simple songs that are just, they're just scripture. Yeah, and I love that you mentioned that as well. I was actually talking to um, someone about this just uh, just two days ago about the hymns, and um, we were talking about how um, the hymns are so powerful and have endured for so long. Um, obviously, because their 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 theology and poetry so compellingly um, put forth, but also because you know back in the days where the hymns were circulating, it wasn't recordings that people were listening to to learn these songs. People were getting literally just the melody written down, you know, the sheet music and the words. Um, and so the songs had to be robust enough and strong enough to stand on their own with just the melody and the words, no matter whose mouth they were in, whether they were in the mouth of a gifted vocalist or just whoever it was at the local tent meeting leading that song these songs had to work so those we've seen the enduring power of songs that can do that now at the same time it's so beautiful now that we get to enjoy um, hymns modern and contemporary hymns through sound um, through Spotify and Apple Music and all of these other platforms and enjoy the gift of um, the sounds of music um, but I also think um, I also think it's good to remember why these hymns um, have endured for centuries, as many of them have, and and continue to um, bring to the church songs that can uh, endure and still speak in that way. Yeah, that's beautiful. So you're passionate about the marriage of theology and art, which I love. My dad's a pastor. You know, oh, I'm awesome. Christian school all the way through. So what is your process like of ensuring that your songs are theologically and biblically accurate as well as, you know, singable and can appeal to the masses? Yeah. Um, well, I feel, I feel really grateful that um, I'm part of a church that takes that really seriously. So when it comes to Hillsong worship and, um, and all of the songs that would come through, you know, the Hillsong worship um, platform, if you will, we actually have our global teaching pastor and his wife, who's also a beautiful theologian, Robert and Amanda Ferguson, every song before it's ever sung on the platform, whether it's ever recorded or not, has to go through Robert and Amanda. And um, people have to be able to make a, a biblical defense for their lyrics. And so um, I have loved just, um, and I know Robert and Amanda love as well, just that dialogue, especially with young songwriters. Like you can't just write something that feels good. Um, you have to write something that's true and, and yes, we can, um, we, yes, we can and should use poetry and language and metaphor and colloquialism at, at, at points to be able to paint the picture um, of, of, uh, of the lyric that we are communicating. But at the same time, if it's not, if it can't be biblically defended, we can't sing it because the reason theology and song is so important for the church is because, you know, we know a lot of people kind of have long commutes or they listen to worship as they're commuting or in the car. And sometimes they're listening to worship music in terms of on a daily basis more than perhaps they're spending time reading the word. So that's why it's so important that, that the, the songs that, that people are listening to and then, and of course, singing out, um, that, that the songs that people's souls are hearing sung forth from their mouths, that it's true because what we believe about God frames how we live for God, how we interact with God, how we interact with others, how we see the world. So what we believe is really important. And of course, what we sing shapes what we believe. Absolutely. Yeah. What we sing matters. I was talking to Keith Getty the other day and he said he was challenging pastors. He's like, care enough about what you're care enough about your congregation that you care about what they sing. Yes. Oh, I gosh. First of all, 
I love that you're talking to Keith Getty and I will just fangirl right there because I mean, talk about a modern hymn writer, like yeah. what, what he has contributed to the church. I am so grateful for. There's a song actually that I, one of my favorite songs by him is a song called, I think it's called Speak O Lord. Um, and it's like a hymn. I don't know if you know that one, but it's like a hymn to be sung like before, you know, before you partake of the word, before the, the, the minister or the preacher or the teacher comes up to teach the word. And I just, I, I think that's so important that we have these songs that prepare our hearts to receive the word and that the worship time isn't the whole service. The worship time is, or, the, or sorry, I shouldn't even say worship because all of the service is worship, but that time of singing um, is actually a beautiful part of something greater that God is doing through the service, which is part of something that he's doing in a community of people, which is part of what he's doing in his church and so I just love the way that God uses um, all of those parts of the service and all of our gifts combined to mature us as a body of Christ. Yeah absolutely. Now Brooke what is your hope for the future of worship music because you have been in this particular field for for a long time and so I'm sure you've seen it change and morph over the years but what do you hope for the future? Um, I hope for purity (laughs) to be honest I think um, especially um, there's there's a lot of noise and there's a lot of um, there's a lot of distraction and I I feel um, I feel like I'm sounding like such an old biddy here <laughs> but I do feel concerned you know for um, for the generations that are coming through what they're seeing what their understanding of worship is what their understanding of being a disciple is um, and I so I think that's why um, I mean not more than ever, because I don't think that's true, but as much as ever, like um, it's purity and integrity has always been, um, you know, when, when those things start to fall down um, in ministry, um, God has to do something about that. And if, if we're not the first to repent, then eventually um, the Lord's going to have to bring some correction or allow some things to happen um, to, to correct our pride or our stubbornness or, um, all of these things. So my hope is um, just for there to continue to be generations who come through, who um, who recognize worship as a sacred thing. It's not cool music. It's an it's an offering and it's a sacrifice. And 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 not just how we bring the song of worship, but how we live worship with our lives actually really matters to the Lord. Um, so that would be my my hope. That's kind of heavy, but it's true. <laughs> I think you're exactly on to something because the statistics show that young people are leaving the church in droves. I think Gen Z is the least biblically minded generation in history. And so I have toddlers, I have two small children. I know you have babies as well. And it is concerning to look at the climate that they're in, see what they're facing, but also seeing sort of the thinness of some of the music that is coming out. It is concerning. Yeah. You know, I think at the same time, you know, the Psalms is our model for the the gamut of of the song of worship. So um, so it also can't be one note because we see in the Psalms this beautiful um, you know rainbow of expression, right? Of expression of worship and expression of praise. So it's not all high praise, and it's not also all lament, and it's not all rejoicing. Um, and so I think that's one of the beautiful things about the worship vocabulary that the Bible teaches us is that it actually is so vast. And so, um, and so we can and should bring our humanity, um, but our humanity can't be the focus of our worship. We, we, we from our place of, of humanness and understanding of, um, of, our, of our sin and the grace that we, we require and the grace that has been given to us through that lens of humanity, we bring uh, worship and we don't deny that but at the same time that can't be the the focus of the worship Christ is always the focus of our worship yeah right absolutely well Brooke thank you so much for your voice in the Christian music world or, or the worship music world and for also writing songs that my children can at three and one can listen to and memorize and sing oh thank you for that encouragement and I hope you like when that when the album comes out there's a song in there um called I belong to Jesus Dylan's song 
and um, my friend Chris and I actually wrote it for my my six year old gave her heart to the Lord last year and so um, I think that that one I think that you'll love because it's from a mother heart of these are the th these are the things that I want Dylan to know and be able to say about what it means to belong to Jesus so I think oh. that'll be a that'll be a nice song for the mamas so I cry still every time I sing it it undoes me but yeah lovely <laughs> oh, well, I can't wait to listen to it. My friend was at your live show in Nashville and she just said it was incredible. It was just, it was honestly the Lord. I felt so peaceful going into the week because I was, like I said to you before, like it wasn't my, this project wasn't my idea. So I was like, all right, Lord, like I'm going to be as faithful with this as, as I can. And we've worked so hard um, and prayed and saturated this thing so much, but this is yours. Like you get to do what you want. And it was just, it was it was holy. It was just, and it was the Lord. It was, yeah, it was incredible. Yeah.